name of our show. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Large Glass. I'm Todd. I'm Terry. And we're happy to have you tonight. The Large Glass is our show where we bring you a new artist or art-related theme every Tuesday night so we can chat about it in the chat room and, and have a good time. Yeah. And there's Ben Hagebush. Hey, Ben. Hey, How's ben. it going? Nice to see you. Um, we're in the throes of summer. Yes, I feel we like are. We're in the, we're in the art lull. It just started. Yes, it is a bit of an art lull. But, but, yes. in order to breathe some light into that art lull. We have an awesome show tonight. We really do. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited, excited about that. Yeah. So uh, tonight we're bringing you an artist live in the studio, which we're excited about, and I know that you guys like that show also. There's Mom. Hi, Mom. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're gonna bring you guys an artist live in the studio tonight after we get done with the normal business, so it looks to be a good show. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let us, there's Dave, there's Jess Park. How's it going? Hello. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for joining us. All of our regulars. And Pumpkin Audrey. Yes. All the regulars, Audrey. Awesome. all the foundational core people that keep us alive yes. are here. And we love that. Thank you. There's Carolyn Thau. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. Who's been traveling around a little bit lately. I'm glad you're, uh, I'm glad you're here. Um, <laughs> should we drink? Of course. We had a problem with the drinks tonight. We did. I mean, I mean, problem with the drinks. I mean, not really, but but we try to coordinate them, and we were having a little bit of a challenge coordinating them today. Jess says John Park is working and can't join, but says hi. Well, we say hi back to him. Hello. So thank you. Please deliver at mm -hmm. that for us. Of course, he could catch it in the rerun. Um, well, the problem with the drink tonight yeah. was that our artist hails from Memphis, Tennessee. And we were trying to find a Memphis beer, and he very generously, well, first of all, he tried to mail us some beer, but that doesn't work. I found out, actually, that not only can't you, but you sort of can, but if you do and you get caught, you face a really hefty fine. Uh, this is what the guy in the liquor store told me. He's, he's like a young, his name is Ryan. He works at Bourbon Street Liquors, which is our local beer establishment, and he's really awesome at helping me find the right beer for the show and I talk to him every week and I think when he sees me come in he tries to hide but he said to me he's like oh yeah no you can ship beer but you got to be really careful because if you get caught you're just you're in huge trouble yeah. so I'm really glad our our artist tonight did not do that then he suggested like numerous beers none of which we could find so I happen to have met this artist at the Vermont Studio Center years ago so I thought well we could do a Vermont beer or we've also hung out in Brooklyn on occasion with some of our mutual friends. And I thought, okay, we've got some Brooklyn beer hanging around. Yeah. So I decided to go with the standby of Six Point. Uh, this can is green, so it's going to suck the green screen right up. Oh, Look, at that. Yes, it is. Look at it's that. It's invisible. It's Phantom beer. But uh, I've got the Bengali and the resin. Now, if you know this beer, you know that the Bengali is 6.6 .6 and the resin is a 9.1. So we're going to save this one for last so I'll be able to speak in 20 minutes. We're going to go Bengali. All right. And you're having a Founders. I'm going to have a Founders. Okay. Well, that's fine. That's not Brooklyn, but you're having a Founders nonetheless. I pre-gamed as I always do. Yes. Yes. And oh, thank you. I'm putting, I'm pouring that way too fast. I that's not cool. I was going to say, I was going to pour yours, but I was worried about oh, the, putting uh, a big head on it. Yeah. That's all right. That's all right. We're going to go Bengali. Bengali. It's a pretty now, name. Now, of course, our artist, who you've already seen in the announcement for the show, mm -hmm. is Mr. Hamlet Dobbins. Now, we're not introducing him just yet. He's not coming on. However, he is right over here on a side screen in our mm -hmm. call. So when I toast, I definitely want to point in his direction, too. But here's to episode 43. Episode 43. So cheers to you. Cheers. When we bring him on, we're going to toast him as well. Uh, but cheers to all of you. Let us know what you're drinking in the chat. We'd love to know. Hamlet would approve. Mm. This one's got some hoppy, real full-bodied. This is our nice standard summer beer. Yeah, that's I a that's a drinkable summer yeah, beer. Very good. This is God. There's a nice cloud in there. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. It's gorgeous. So, hmm. let's get on with some. Uh, 
What do we got? Chris, mom, mom's drinking coffee. Coffee. Carolyn Thau extended tier one subscription through January. Awesome. Carolyn, thank you. That's awesome. And we love your support. 63 is here. Hey. Um, ben says, congrats. 63 says, going cheap. Boda Box Old Vines Inn. That's all right. Hey, that's that's a, all right. That's totally a summer beer. We got some um, or boring summer, Pinot. Summer, beer, summer wine. Um, <laughs> boring Pinot Grigio from Pumpkin Audrey. That's not boring. Ben says he's drinking Jack Straight. Wow. I know that's not true, Ben. I know that's not true. <laughs> Although it does fit for tonight, so that's good. That's mm -hmm. good. You're, you're, you're in the spirit of things. We love that. Um, why don't we do... A little featured supporter. Let's do that. Well, well, not a little Moscow Mule for Jess Park. All right. Nice. That's a good one. Uh, so tonight's featured supporter, the one we want to say thank you to, and if you knew who last week's was, and she's drinking a Moscow Mule right now, we're going to go with John Park, who can't join us tonight. So, Jess, you're going to have to tell him yes. that he is the featured supporter tonight. So thank you to John. We really appreciate you being there with us and supporting us the way you do. Mm -hmm. We love having you on the show. And your dialogue, what you contribute to the chat, it's fantastic. So thank you for that. You really make the show special, and we mm -hmm. appreciate it. So yeah, cheers to you. thank you, John. Cheers to you. Yeah. Cheers. We could toast all kinds of people. Cheers to you and you and you. Be careful, all right? Just just okay. be careful. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're doing great. All right. All right. So, Jess says, oh, boy, I will tell him to watch the replay. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't do it without him. Let's jump over to birthdays. Let's do it. All right. So, uh, we have only two only birthdays two. tonight, not and that is not our birth. This that guy is fun. not the birthday. Well, this he, guy. he is, but he's not, not the first yet. One. Not the first one. Yeah. That's so right. uh, June seems to be a light month for artists' birthdays. It is, especially towards the end of June. Yeah. So two so, tonight. So who do we have here? Yeah. So we have on June 25th, this is Eric Carl, who recently passed away. I know. Uh, he was born in 1929, very famous children's book illustrator, author. He wrote The Very Hungry Caterpillar back in 1969. Um, which has been a classic and a staple on most children's bookshelves. So, happy birthday to Eric Carl. You know what I meant to do for this? I was going to grab the Very Hungry Caterpillar from one of the kids' rooms upstairs. And I think it's on the sixth day, the caterpillar eats, and he goes through this whole line of pieces, like one piece of pie, two pieces, and it, yes. it, this entire beautiful long list of things. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually a really fun passage to read. I oh, love yeah, that. it's great. So it's a great book. Really Happy birthday. Great. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Carl. Who's this? This is Peter Paul Rubens. He was born on June 28th in 1577, Flemish artist, uh, uh, known for the uh, Flemish Baroque tradition, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. prolific 17th century painter, uh, a lot of altarpieces, landscapes, mythology, of allegory, course. biblical stuff. So um, he was actually a diplomat that was knighted by both uh, King Philip IV in Spain and King Charles I in England. I did not know that. He was. So, yes, very uh, famous painter, and his birthday is on the 28th. Okay. All right, and I actually thrown a third one in there, but it turns out his birthday is next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. So we'll feature him next Tuesday. Yep. All right, so that's going to wrap up birthdays for this week, yeah. just two. All right, and so last but not least, we always talk about support. Now, I have been talking about Susan Stillman's painting donation for weeks without having that locked down as to which one we were getting. Well, we know now which one we're getting. And we are getting this beautiful eight inch by 10 inch painting of hers called Catching Light, which I'm super thrilled about. All right, this painting could be yours. We're gonna be giving this away in a raffle on the show. The only thing you need to buy into the raffle is to be a follower of the channel and your viewer loyalty points that show up right next to the chat room, next to that little purple bubble, help you gain favor in the raffle. So if you've been watching like my mom has since the first day, every minute of everything we've ever aired, <laughs> then she's got tens of thousands of points. Now, I put a cap on how many you can spend, but you can use those to actually get an advantage. Now, that doesn't mean anything. You could be a brand new follower and have a couple hundred points and still win this painting, yes. right? However, 
We're not giving it away until we get to 200 followers. Now we are inching along that list. We're at yeah. 153. We have 47 followers to go. So number one, if you're out there watching right now, you've come to see Hamlet Dobbins tonight live in his studio, or you like what we do, you like the fact that every week on a Tuesday night when the weekend is really far away, there's not a lot necessarily to do, you can sit down and have a light conversation and an excuse to drink while we talk about an artist, then this show's for you and you should follow it because what a good thing, right? And if you follow, you're going to get us closer to giving away this painting, yes. which you could wind up taking home. So... You know, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> we got a couple comments in here. So we mom's like, do. oh, wow, I want this. Uh -huh. And Pumpkin Audrey says, just give it to Chris, uh. meaning mom. Because mom tends to win a few too many She's things. She's very lucky. Yeah, I, is. this is in no but, way. But, yes. Carolyn won the last Carolyn piece. Carolyn did win the last piece. I right? feel like Pumpkin Audrey won something in the past, too. Yeah, Pumpkin Audrey's so, won before. Yeah. So, anyway, so this could be yours. Now, if you've already followed us and you're looking for other ways to support us one other way that you could support us is we are on patreon okay so you could subscribe to us on patreon if you do subscribe on patreon and we thank those of you who are already there you unlock special benefits videos that we post that are exclusive to our patrons um we've been doing a funny little series that we've been trying to stay on top of the best we can called who's your favorite artist uh we've been posting those every week uh, we are also going to be going around and doing show reviews at galleries and museums. Next Saturday, we're going to be heading into the city and seeing a couple of shows. Yeah. And we're going to be posting reviews of that. Some of that stuff will be exclusive to our patrons. So if you're curious about that, you can go to patreon.com forward slash forward slash the large glass separated by underscores. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, tell a friend. Yeah. Have them come watch the show. Tell a friend. All right, so enough of all the hubbub. Carolyn Thousis, and thank you again for my lovely Basquiat notebook. See? Yes. Yes. I'm really, I'm glad you got that. That's yeah. a, it's a fantastic book. It really is. Uh, and 63 says, not that I need an excuse to drink, but nice to know I have another. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Now, 63, you got to get out there and get some friends in here. All right. Get, get some others to come along and, and join the show because yeah. you definitely contribute beautifully to that chat. All right. Enough of all of that stuff. Oh, I hate usernames is here. Too. Oh, I hate username 67 is here. Three other artists' birthdays, by the way. Oh, he's checking us. Oh, yeah. All right, so I got it. Okay, so you have to tell us before the show. Yeah, you can't do it tonight. But... <laughs> You're like, just to let you know. Okay, and right. and here's the thing, 67, because we got 63 and 67. Yes. 67, what, what you could do is you could get in touch with Terry and let her know. And yes, Gordon Matta Clark. I did see that Gordon Matta Clark. Oh, is that right? Yeah, but it was late. You, you know, know that happens though, because last week, um, Toshiko Takaizu had a birthday too, and we missed it. So, right. And that's been happening periodically. It's it's unfortunate. I think we missed uh, Benny Andrews' birthday. So, but as we get better, our database gets bigger, and, and we, we want won't miss it next year. Right. So. We, we we love that. So these contributions are very very helpful. So he's got Ed Paschke, uh, his Chicago Harry Who painter. And Oscar Fischinger, mm -hmm. uh, a cubist dude, mm -hmm. which is how you should describe him when you introduce him there you as go. a cubist dude. Cubist dude. So thanks for that, 67. Okay, so let's get to the artist tonight because yes. I think that's what's most important, right? Uh, let's see. We're going to go here. And I finally am finally switching over to the guest screen with the curtain up rather than switching over there with the curtain exposed. Yeah, we didn't break curtain this time. We didn't break curtain. That's right. Would you like to, um, would you like to get us started and give our I introduction tonight? I'd love to get us started. So we are really fortunate tonight. We've had him on our calendar for a little while. Yep. Um, we have an artist joining us live from his Memphis, Tennessee studio. Uh, he has a BFA from the University of Memphis, an MFA from the University of Iowa. He teaches. Um, he's had multiple fellowships, multiple grants and awards. Um, he shows regionally as well as nationally. He's represented by two different galleries to my knowledge right now. We have the David Lust Gallery in both Memphis and Nashville, as well as the White Space Gallery in Atlanta, Georgia. 
and he's a good friend. And of can I Tom's. jump in and add a few things? Because I want to also add that he is one of the most generous, friendly, and kind people I have ever met. And I've known him for years, but I'm going to pull the curtain back now on you, Mr. Hamlet Dobbins. Welcome to the show. Introducing Hamlet Dobbins. God, I hope I have a, a good blood sugar night. I hope that like I, I don't like suddenly start getting all down and then everybody will be like, damn, what were they Todd's talking? friends are really weird and sad. I don't think you have it. I don't think that's going to happen. Nope. All right, we'll try. All right. I, I appreciate that. How you doing? How's it going? Great. Well, now, so in prepping for tonight, I actually looked on the Facebook and I was like, well, whose birthday is it tonight? And I actually don't have any Facebook friends whose birthday is tonight. Oh. Apparently, Kojo Griffiths was yesterday. Okay. And Ann Pible, who's a great painter, uh -huh. who I am contractually obligated to mention, was an Iowan. Um, her, her birthday was two days ago. So, gotcha, gotcha. Two, two awesome possum people. Oh, I appreciate you bringing them up. That's awesome. We should add them to our list so we can have them every year. Go. And, and we got to get, we have been trying to get everyone that's been on the show yes. added to so this as gonna well. So we're going to need your birthday. So sometimes. Although Todd probably has it. Yeah, we have, we have Hamlet's birthday. Okay. Yeah, we've got that. Yeah, it's in there. So, oh, let's see. 63 says, and she teaches at Bennington. So, Bennington. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is 63 a Benningtoner? I believe 63 is a Benningtoner. Um, oh. It's going to take him a second to type that in. Yes, he is. He is. And like a former Benningtoner or a current Benningtoner? It would definitely be former. Um, okay. But I don't know by how many years, but I'll bet he's going to put that in the chat too. And let's see. Terranissimo says, hi, Hammy D. Hammy D. Okay. I don't know who that is. Okay. Well, maybe Ter... ter Terranissimo will follow. He says, yes, 2002 mm -hmm. was the Bennington year. Oh, okay. So. So she had just started. Ah, okay. Okay. I think because she was, she finished the year before me at Iowa. She finished, or, or rather the year before I started. So she finished in two, not 1996. And then she taught at Alfred. Uh-huh. Mm. And then I think she went to Bennington, but she is awesome. I love those paintings. That's fantastic. Good, good. So we got a connection here already. This is brilliant. We're just starting it's out. It's the art world Venn Venn diagram. Yes. It's a terrifying, terrifying the tiny, thing. The tiny We're all connected middle, in the middle. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so let's see. Where should we Where oh, should we gosh. begin with Hamlet? Because first of all, I have to let you guys know when I went out there to gather images for this. Uh, if you go to hamletdobbins.com, if you want to look at his work and look up things that he's done just in terms of curatorial endeavors, collaborations, there's a lot going on there's on that website. There's a lot going on. There's paintings, there's drawings, there's, I loved the chronology because it kind of puts into perspective some of the artwork that you do as well. But there's a lot going on, especially in the collaborations. I'm curious on how they all got started. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's quite big. And so I mean I think I think the best place to start is to give people, you know, just a sort of an aesthetic overview, look at some of the paintings, talk mm -hmm. about your process. Mm -hmm. That that just seems to be the sensible place to start. And and if and of course practice, right? I think is also going to kind of play into this at some point, but mm -hmm. you know. I do want to say if anybody has any questions to start typing them in the chat earlier than later because there is that delay and then that way it kind of adds to the flow of the whole right and we try our best to dialogue. get to everybody as best we can so uh you know we'll we'll do our best so hamlet i've got images up here uh to start they're all paintings okay. they come off of your website almost in an order as you have them listed but oh okay you know just to kind of like keep it somewhat ordered and we can bounce around all we want but can you can you start off you know like a lot of the times on this show we we come to this show we've got a lot of people that are you know either skilled artists studio artists that are working in the studio every day we've got people that are academics we've got people that are critics and we've got people that are brand new to the field of art completely that come here because they're curious they want to learn something new and we try to take away that sort of uh fear 
that they might have when it comes to talking about work or, or dealing with this in general. And, and so one of the, the, the walls that we have to try and break through with this has to do with abstraction. Sometimes is a tough one for people to wrap their heads around because it's hard for sometimes for people who can't identify things immediately. It's like, where's this person coming from? So can we, can we just talk a little bit about that? Like, wh what is the impetus for you to make a painting? Where do you begin? What drives you? Can, First of all, let me just say that I'm terrified that Terry has her notebook and that like the notebook is out and I'm worried that either she's going to write something down that I need that to rebuke or or say I didn't say later. Um, yeah, that's well, kind of, I mean, she's meticulous, I mean, in terms yeah. of uh, well, yeah, and then that's where the questions are, too, right? There's, there's a couple. Cause you're the you're the deep diver. I but. You got it. I, I I I watched the show. I'm 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 aware. I, I'm I a little bit on. of a deep diver, but not. You know, you from what you put out there, and it's interesting that we're talking about the genesis. Like, where do some of the ideas come from? And uh, looking at your chronology, it starts with a bink, you know, and then it just keeps. And I'm talking like 300 years before you were born. Like it it begins with this little big bang you know yeah. and it just kind of builds and that's kind of how your artwork goes so I'm, that sounds good uh, yeah and I'm well i mean uh, the, the the chronology kind of came from an assignment that i gave my students and it, it was a way for me to kind of get to know them you know and and then also for like up, upper level drawing classes sometimes what we'll do is we'll have the the chronology is there in their sketchbooks. And so what we can do is, uh, you know, like if, if we have an assignment where I'm like, take your most visual memory, like your most vivid, powerful memory. And I'm like, go, go into your chronology and pull and pull it out. And that way they don't have to like sit there and be like, I don't know what's, what's, what's visual. And so that way they've, they've, they've got something there. Uh -huh. And um, it was an assignment that I used for a long time and my students had so much fun doing it. And I was like, oh my God, they're having so much fun doing it. I should totally do this too. And so I, I started doing it. And it's something that I've worked on probably for 10 or 12 years. And so it's, it's, it's just something that I, when something pops up, I'll send a note to my, my, my webman and he'll add it to it. Um, and then like just in terms of thinking about how does abstraction come about for me, that's just kind of the way my brain has always, always worked. And so the paintings come from these magic moments where I feel a kind of whole body pleasure. And, and I've, I've had depression my whole life and um, the moments of full body pleasure are really rare. And so when I feel them, I, I want to hang on to them and I want to understand them. Um, and so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll try and rebuild that experience using teeny tiny little parts of it. So like one experience was when I went back to Iowa and after I had graduated and, and, a, and a good friend of mine was still there and we were walking along and she had just gotten her hair cut and colored this really great red and we were walking along and we we came across this freshly cut palette of sod and it was it had dew on it and then and it was this lush green and the sky was this great iowa blue and um and I, and, and then she and, and she leaned down and she put her cheek against the grass to see what it would feel like and it was this really beautiful moment. And I probably made, I don't know, 20 paintings about that. And sometimes it can be about like, well, was it the grass against the skin? Or was it the red of the hair against the blue sky? Was it the shape of the side? Was it the pattern in the dress? You know, like what, what was it that moved me? You know, what was it that made me feel connected to the world and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, 
And so what I do is I, I, I build these or I try and rebuild these experiences. Um, in the old days, I would, I would build them out of um, collage materials and I would, um, you know, take drawings or photographs or color combinations that somehow resonated with that moment to kind of try and rebuild it or understand it. And, um, and then I, I started working with Photoshop. And so now I construct the, the paintings in Photoshop and then I print them off and then I can come in and just go to work. And so that way, and that, that's also a, a byproduct of being a parent and, and, and having a schedule. And so I kind of clear off this time where I can just be a genius in the studio and, and listen to Tool real loud and just make stuff and, and improv and riff and play. And then, you know, I, I print these things off, these things over here behind me. And um, then I'm, I, I basically just make the paintings. They're almost like still lives. Hmm. And so I like, I have the thing in front of me and I'm trying to figure out how to make the painting painting look like or rhyme with well enough the maquette and there's a really beautiful slowness to the process of making the paintings that um it's almost like watching a thing kind of slowly come alive mm -hmm. and so there's a, a a slow a slowness that's that's forged in that time with the painting where I'm able to um, uh, sort of wrap myself in these moments. You know, it's, it's um, you, when you said you probably made 20 paintings about that moment, about that experience, and then you're talking about, was it her skin against the grass? Was it the shape of the sod? Was it the color of her hair against the sky? Um, I, I, I love how the, the need as a visual thinker, as someone who works visually, to work out the the why of all of that through all these different visual uh, um, trajectories. Yeah, I mean, because what I'm trying to do is see if I can put them back together in a way where they would have that resonance. Mm. Um, and and sometimes they they spin off and. And like in the process of making, like I'll, I'll think, well, you know, there's something about that sky color that reminds me of the day that I had this really great tea party with my little girl on the back porch. Mm. And then maybe I'll combine those two experiences. And so sometimes those, um, sometimes the way those, those experiences come together can add some, some mojo some some excitement, some unexpected finding to that experience. Yeah, and then, you know, another thing that occurs to me in this, especially for our viewers who are now thinking to themselves, oh, wow, okay, I'm, I, I now understand where he's coming from. By the way, Hamlet, cheers. We, we, we didn't oh, get a chance to toast Cheers. You. Cheers to you. Come by. Yeah. One thing I'm thinking about in terms of our viewers is, okay, so our viewer comes to a piece of yours, a painting. And by the way, you should know that many of these paintings are very large. Um, they're, you know, like we're talking 60 by 72, like large scale pieces in a lot of these senses. So when you approach something like this, you're really absorbed. Uh, you're, you're not standing in front of a small picture. You're standing in front of something that's really absorptive on some level. But our, I, I'm curious then if our viewer comes to a painting, for example, and has not had the explanation of what drives the initial making of the piece, they're probably asking themselves, all right, well, how do I get there? Mm. And, right. and, and, and I think that's a really common question. Mm -hmm. And you know, and for me, as, as somebody who paints and, and works through visual problems, I'm gonna come to a piece like this one that's you know sitting right over here, and I'm gonna say, okay, I've, t I've totally got this, right? Not necessarily the exact impetus that drove Hamlet to making it, mm. but I'm, I'm, I'm really connecting to certain um, uh, uh, aesthetic 
issues, problems, and not problems in a bad way, but problems in, in, in a sort of equational way that, that I can connect with, that mm -hmm. I can understand. But how do the other people do that? Hmm. I mean, is that, I mean, that's probably something you get, Hamlet, from your students occasionally, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, like, w w one thing that I think about a lot is I, I used to listen to the Stern Show a lot. And I remember Artie Lang was on Terry Gross. And Terry Gross is also a huge Howard Stern fan. And I remember Artie was on there and she, he was kind of talking about his, how the humor of the show operates sometimes in a way that isn't for all people. Mm -hmm. We'll keep that real vague. Mm -hmm. but, but basically he said, that the Stern show is kind of like the Simpsons really smart people like it and really dumb people like it, but the, and they like it for totally different reasons, but they also like it for really similar reasons. And mm -hmm. so like, I'm not saying like dumb people can't like my paintings, but what I'm saying is like people have said that they think about my paintings as being painters paintings. And I, and I'm, yeah, I mean, I love I love paint. I love the way paint works, and so I think painters have an experience with the paintings. Mm -hmm. But I also I hope that civilians, you know, would have an experience with the paintings where they feel my connection to it, and then and and then hopefully through that, um, Fabian Marcaccio had that great line about um, the exchange of affection between the artist and the object and people being able to come away with that. And I love that line. And, mm. and for me, it, it really is. It's a very um, intimate, personal, um, physical connection between me and these objects. Yeah. And, and hopefully people will, will get that. I mean, I, one question I always ask my students is like, well, what's the, what's the, like the thought bubble above the person's head standing in front of your piece? What's the ideal thing that's inside that thought bubble? And so like, for me, you know, it's this exchange of affection. Hopefully I've created a thing that's complicated enough or simple enough or, combine certain elements in a way that will get them to a place where they experience a similar level of discovery or joy that I did when I was making the paintings and then also conceiving the paintings. You know, it's funny that there, there's something that Terry and I have discussed, um, you know, on our own for a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and we've both been artists. I mean, I've been an artist my whole life. You know, Terry's been painting for many, many years. And about four or five years ago, we decided to go out and plein air paint together. And yeah, I saw those images, yeah. Yeah, and you know, it, it really, so now that we've done that, not that we couldn't do this before, but the act of looking, the, the experience of actually really looking hard and understanding the way light is hitting the branch of a tree or the way light is falling and creating a shadow on the side of a building will change the way you look at the landscape forever. Mm -hmm. And it will change the way you look at the way color is received, light is received, whether or not you're painting. And so I wonder if your experience with your friend from that, you know, when you came home to the color of the hair, the grass, the, the sky is, is there's an exchange there that is an influence of the, the act of painting and then re sort of uh, informs the way you look at now everything, which then reinforms the painting and the cycle continues like synergistically to, to grow. And I just yeah, want to that's mention- that's really beautiful. I just, thank you. I just want to mention to the, everyone in the chat, I do see your questions and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down them. I'm, I'm not ignoring you guys, I do see them. Um, but I like that. And I think that, I think for people that have trouble looking at work in this vein, it, it, if they open themselves up to looking really hard, mm -hmm. not just at painting, but at everything, 
I, I think that's going to make that experience of looking at painting that much more rewarding. Mm -hmm. I mean, right? And we've, we've talked about this. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, that, like, I talk to my drawing students all the time about this, this moment. It was like this, um, it was kind of crippling, almost like traumatic. Like, I remember being in a drawing class, and I remember we were just working on some dumbass like still life drawing and it was like a contour drawing but I remember leaving that class and like walking out into the really boring like shitty 1970s architecture quad and being totally wigged out by how everything was connected yeah like the park bench was connected to the bushes because they were behind him and then the bushes were connected to the building and the building was connected to the sky and like it was like all of this like connectedness that was really beautiful but overwhelming you know and, and then i of course have to tell my students you know that i did I, I don't do drugs and and i wasn't tripping after class or anything but it it was this really beautiful powerful moment where i recognized that all of these things were were touching one another mm -hmm. yeah and it's like there is this kind of i, I can completely get that Right. It's, it's as if you have open, you've unlocked a certain part of the way you process visual information through your hand touching that surface and, 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 and now giving your eye a new way to sort of experience that. It then in turn experiences everything else through that similar kind of lens. Yeah. And then you understand it better. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that I think people are looking for when they when they come to a painting and they don't understand it and they're like, I, I don't get what's going on here. I think that frustration comes from the fact that they know somewhere that someone's seeing something they can't. And, and, and that's got to be frustrating. Well, I mean, I think part of it is like, you know, like sometimes you'll talk to people and they'll be like, oh, there's a bunny. Or, oh, yeah, I, I, I see a I see a clown or that's. You know, that's a clown face right? or whatever. And, and I don't, and I totally don't see it. Like if you, if you click back like four paintings, there's one that's just like clearly a boob. And, and I was sitting there in the studio and I was like, God damn it. There's a boob there. You know, <laughs> like it's so obvious had, that that's a boob. And I totally. That said the same thing. Yeah. It's, and, and I just totally changes, didn't think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then I was like, well, maybe somebody won't see a boob and, or maybe they will see a boob. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't I... mean to make a boob painting, <laughs> but you know how it is. <laughs> no, I, I totally I didn't see a boob at first. <laughs> now I do. Well, but now it's just ruined. I, I got it now. It's, it's, it's exactly. a great painting. It's good. Good job, Hamlet. Yeah, no. Don't, oh, don't, good. don't throw the painting Excellent. out, Hamlet. But you know, yeah. this, this has been, this has been a, an ongoing conversation that I actually have with my students. And I've also had with, um, with other people that, you know, they're kind of like looking at a painting and they say, well, you know, they want to know how to talk about the work. And so they say, well, where do I begin? And I'm like, well, it's fine to begin with what you can reference and what you know, right? But then once you get past that immediate point, think of that as the surface level, right? You're skimming across the surface of that painting and you, you can make immediate referential things. Like in this case, in the boob painting, I would probably say, all right, I see blue, I see, I see brown, I see a weave, I see this, you know, this, I'm not gonna say nipple, but I'm gonna say I see this circular, this point in the middle mm -hmm. of that. And then, then we go a little bit deeper. We mm -hmm. might go into a dream state. We might go into something we reference from our childhood. We mm -hmm. might go into something that references the landscape or, mm -hmm. or, or physical objects or architecture, or whatever. Um, but I think that that first level, that top tier kind of, I see a boob, that's okay. You know, that's okay. And now, okay, great. Now let's move on. Yeah, I think it's sometimes seeing something so literal helps somebody to connect with it. And it presents a foundation for right. a dialogue to start happening. But um, also I think it's part of it. It's like how our brains work. Yeah, it is. You know, We're like some people are just naturally gravitated toward abstraction or figuration or a landscape. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, you know, like we were talking about before, it can, it can, it can work that way for other people as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I got to read some stuff from the comments so that we can get caught up here because we got a lot of people that are saying things. 
Uh, let's see. So Pumpkin Audrey wants to know what type of paint you use. I think that's a good question. Great. Um, <laughs> what do you use? Well, I was an oil painter for a long time. And then when I moved back to Memphis from Rome, I unpacked my oil paint. And I was like, I got this sweet like air filter machine and it's going to be no problem. And I, I opened up that box and I was like, oh, my God, there's no way I can do that. Because before I had had my studio downstairs or separated. And for years and years, I had done collaborations with acrylic because I could think faster and be quicker and it would dry quicker. And it was like playing speed chess. And every once in a while, you know, I'd wake up from my nap and I'd be like, you know, Hamlet, like, you should really just switch to acrylic. And then I would look to that big like pile of oil paint with like thousands of dollars worth of yeah. oil paint. And I yeah. was just like, maybe not. <laughs> but but when I opened that box, man, and that smell was so bad and my studio was going to have to be in the center of the house. Like you're going to have to walk through my studio to the kitchen. Yeah. And I was like okay, let's just switch to acrylic because I had, um, well, the, uh, the acrylic that I use is the, uh, tonight's show is sponsored by golden. Um, <laughs> I use the golden fluid and the high flow yeah. because that's the consistency the, basically that I would, um, Mix your oils sort of too. dilute my oils down. Yeah. So it really wasn't, it wasn't a massive shift. Um, Although I have to say several times, like mid, mid painting, I'll be like, oh my God, these colors are on like 11 and I've got to chill these colors out. These colors are fucking insane. And so I need to like, let's have about some grays. And so the acrylics definitely, you know, it's like having a, a V6 after you've had a, a like a four cylinder, right. you know, you're like, oh, oh my God, I'm going a hundred. Right. But um, yeah, so I use um, acrylic. Okay. All right. Let's see. We also have uh, 63 says the true beauty of being an artist. You can see these connections going back to what we were talking about between how making art sort of unlocks something and that visual connection. Mm -hmm. uh, Pumpkin Audrey is saying she's loving the conversation and she did see the boob. Um, 67 says a lot of people think there is supposed to be some profound meaning that's beyond them because it's art and i i, I think that's yeah right i on. mean you know as a as a person who used to work as a curator like i would go to a gallery space and then i would see people in front of a painting and then they'd be like hey where's that where's that label with the paragraph that explains this painting and i'm i i get it i mean sometimes it's awesome to have that but then sometimes you know it's okay you just you don't know mm -hmm. And, and, I mean, because I, I like the last thing we need is to have to read to enjoy this experience, oh, this visual, this purely very visual experience. Thank you. Thank you. Because one of my rants that I go on, although all some the people time, like reading, well, yeah, a lot of yeah, people they do. And, and museums think that that's the only way to educate someone is to yeah. have, you know, a 30 foot high by 40 foot wide wall text before you enter the show that tells you exactly yep. how to think about what you're about to see. Well, you know, yeah. when you're thinking about learning though, people learn on different levels. Very some true. people are visual, some people are auditory, some people have to read, some people are tactile. So <clears throat> appealing to them on that level isn't a bad thing, but all these other levels come into play. Like I can't sit, I can't read the things on the wall. Like, I'm a visual learner. Right. I want to get in there and, and see what's mm -hmm. going on and try to figure it out that way. Right. So, I right. Know you're about to go on your rant, but I'm like, no, 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 hey. I'm done. <laughs> I'm not going to do my rant because we've got some really, really cool uh, qu questions coming up. So, Mudbirds is asking, what's the trail in your mind that takes you from your initial image inspirations to the abstracted shapes, like with the stars and flowers? So, yeah, there is, there is that interesting, like, what, where's the translation point? between that experience like you described before and how you arrive at this new place? I don't know. I mean, I, I know there are times that I've made paintings that are just like, nope, 
I don't, I don't really need to do anything with that. So like the image that you used for the promo of the landscape through the hole was direct. I, I didn't, I didn't do anything to that. I just, I was like, how do I make a landscape painting? Cause I don't, every time I sat down to think about breaking it down, I was like, I didn't, I don't really need to do that. I'm just going to make a landscape painting. Mm. And so like there, there are some where I have to sit with them for a little while. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, the last show I had in Memphis, I had a, a painting that was burst on a photograph that, that I took 15 years ago, something crazy like that. And, and it's been in, in like four studios. And every time I would unpack this image and be like, I still don't know how to make a painting with this image in it. And then I think I figured it out. I think I figured it out a year ago, but, but now I'm rethinking it hmm. anyway. Well, you know, and it's funny too, because if we look at this image on the screen right now and the difference <laughs> between an image on the screen like this and one like this, mm -hmm. there, there are so many similar properties to the ground, for example, mm -hmm. but then what has been added to or taken away from or dug into or extracted yeah. from to get to this space, th th it seems like the leap from one to the other, you know, from something that, and I don't want to reduce this to the, to the word pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Or I don't want to reduce it to something simplistic, but to get to here yeah. feels to me like just from a, um, a neurological kind of experience, there's something bigger going mm -hmm. on. And I could be wrong about that. Maybe bigger is a bad word because it's qualitative, but you know. No, 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 I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I think for me, the thing that I like about acrylic is that it's allowed me to move really quickly. So like before, when I was working with oils, you know, the process obviously was much slower. I had to wait on things to dry and all the stuff that goes along with oils. Um, and, and so when I would work on a painting, I was more likely to just let that painting be that experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, like say for example, this painting, I'm working on several paintings that are based on this painting where I'm like, okay, what happens if instead of having that green background, what if I just let those piles fill the space? Mm. And so now I'm more um, thinking about the paintings lead to the next painting as right. opposed to um, trying to, to bend the paintings to the idea. Now I'm more interested or kind of interested in, in, in just letting the paintings dictate what happens next. Gotcha. Gotcha. A couple of real good comments. Bujaz says that uh, on the comment before that when we were talking about this notion of um, text and education and reading about a painting versus looking at a painting, mm. Bujaz says mystery is important. Imagine if we heard what Bill Murray said to Scarlett Johansson at the end of Lost in Translation. And I'm just like, yeah. boom, yes, that's exactly yeah. the point. Mm -hmm. Because what a beautiful moment that was in not knowing. No. No, right. I love great. not knowing. Yeah. You know, like people were bitching about the Sopranos ending. I love not knowing. Yeah. Like the worst thing you can do is be like lost and explain everything and be like, oh, they were dead the whole time. And it's like, fuck you, that was a horrible answer. Just let us not know. Like I love not knowing. Yes. Like, like sometimes I remember early in my life as a maker, I would stand in front of the painting and people would be like, all right, so like, what's this painting from? And then I'd be like, well, there's this movie called Harvey with Jimmy Stewart. And then they'll be like, Jimmy Stewart was a crazy gun having NRA supporting wackadoo Republican. I hate Jimmy Stewart. And then they would just huff off and I'd be like, Anyway, in this movie, he does this really sweet thing where he like, <laughs> talks about this thing, and then they just, but they're gone. But I can just watch the, the magic like disappear from their eyes, and then I'm just like, see? And then they're just like, why the hell would anybody make a painting about something so dumb as a girl putting her face against sod? Dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and so now, I mean, I tell people, but I'm not going to be like, Todd, this painting, you know, Terry, don't, you know, this part over here on the green came from this thing. 
Yeah. Right. You know, just be like. Right. No. Yeah. I. I. You know. You. You. You put that so beautifully. That is. Yeah. That's. That's. That's where. Yeah. My whole sort of problem with where we have. You know. Because here's where it begins. Right. Almost wholly. Almost entirely. The arts is supported by and and propelled by academia, and in academia, it's our job, right, to sort of to sort of uh, uh, rip ex rip out the thought process from the student, mm -hmm. or 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 force them to externalize their their thought process in, in some meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And how does that come out? Well, that comes out as words, critique. Especially group critique, critique. I don't know Hamlet how many first year classes you've taught or foundation level classes you've taught, but first year critique can be one of the most grueling experiences, and, and it partially has to do with why children stop drawing. Children stop drawing because we assign so much value to what we can understand and mm -hmm. extrapolate from that drawing. Oh, what is it? Is, is it that a penguin? A cat? Is yeah. that a penguin? Yeah. Right. Yep. And so, when all of a sudden we we pressure everything. To have to have this this tertiary level of words assigned to it, mm -hmm. it murders it on it some level. And so I love I love that you're mentioning that about Jimmy Stewart. Um, so Memory Vessel says I do like to hear what an artist is interested in. That adds to the work experience. No, I totally agree, mm -hmm. right? Because I think an artist's sort of uh, impetus for making is certainly sure. part of the whole thing. Uh, yeah, and and. And I think that's the cool thing about the world where we live now. Like, I feel like my Instagram feed is pretty indicative of the stuff that I care about. Right. You know, right. Um, the chronology talks about things. Mm. My lectures, when I go to a school, when I have a show or something, you know, it. it I, I mean, as much as I want to tell the world that these paintings, you know, they, they, they totally stand on their own and, and um, I don't need an artist statement. It helps, you know, it's a bridge. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And as an educator, I can't not, I, I can't dismiss everything that kind of goes with this. Mm -hmm. There's some really funny stuff though happening here. So, but my mom does say that Harvey is one of her favorite movies, by the way. It's, we, 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 I literally watched it last night oh, so it, for, for Father's Day. Yeah, it's oh. my favorite movie. Uh, it was my dad's favorite movie. Uh, Jess Park is commenting on my use of the word neurological. She said, neurological like some mild form of synesthesia, which is interesting when we're talking about the leaps from... Yes, well, actually, when you were mentioning how you were trying to capture the feel of the, the skin and the dew and everything, I was, in the back of my head, I'm like, wow, this does sound like a synesthesia where you're trying to interpret what you're visually seeing with the feeling and then reinterpret it as what you're putting down on the canvas. So like there's this whole sensory processing and putting it back out there for a different kind of experience. Yeah, yeah. So I was kind of thinking the same sort of thing. Well, and then there's another thing we talked about before that was unrelated, but it is related when we were talking about the smell of oil paint. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times I've described a painting, maybe just to myself quietly or to someone else that would understand, where I want to eat the painting. Yes. And, and I mean that genuinely because the, the, the there's a palatability to the, the texture, surface, and, 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 and residue of paint that is so appealing to me. And mm -hmm. it's not like I have pica, pica, pica. pica. But I, I really want sometimes to, to, to taste that painting, mm -hmm. right? But wait, the best one is yet to come, Hamlet. It, super seductive. I mean, oil paint, like who, who was it that said that, that, that oil, that, that flesh was the reason oil painted was invented oh, or something like that? Uh, Rembrandt or Bacon. It might've been one of those. Like it wasn't Renoir. <laughs> No. 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 Oh my God. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. We. She said that as a joke. So yeah. fat a joke. little cheeks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> flesh. Lots of flesh. No. That's yeah. horrible flesh. Yeah. That's cotton candy. Yeah. That's not yeah. flesh. Yeah. But get this. Yeah. Earlier, Boo Jazz had mentioned mystery is important, and the thing about Scarlett Johansson and Bill Murray. He says, that being said, the rumor was that Bill whispered to Scarlett, "quote I think that painting is of a balloon and not a boob." So I love, <laughs> uh, I love that. I love that. Uh, 63 says the professionalization of art was not a good step. Totally agreed. Uh, says haptic experiences. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out where in line that falls, but I know we're talking about this this notion of um, synesthesia, tactility, eating paint. Um, Memory Vessel says, also, color of paint adds to that want. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally does. Uh, 63 says, probably Lucian Freud about the flesh, I think, and the paint. That sounds good. That makes sense. Oh, and 67, 63 says Freud, 67 says bacon. And that they is were a like twins. They were like little Twinkies. <laughs> Oh, Skultori is here. Ooh. Professional practice UG. Amen. Um, oh, undergraduate. Professional practices undergraduate. Yeah. Uh, 63 says, I don't know. Okay, so we're on the fence about who said that. Skultori might know. Mm -hmm. Skultori. There's got to be a, like a machine that you could type in like a quote and, and ask then it a question. somebody's name might come out. Maybe. I don't know who. I don't. Maybe, we should maybe we'll invent that later. Flesh and paint. Do you want to see if you can find it? I can Let's try. see if you can find it. She's got the notebook out. But She's we'll coming see. at it. So um, I'm, I have forgotten to advance the slides. We're just talking so That's much okay. here. Uh, okay. So I'm curious about I'm curious about visual vocabulary, right? And so if if I look through the chronology of what you've done uh, and and kind of just explore the way in which your paintings seem to grow, I, I see little indicators of how the vocabulary you use in your work visually uh, evolves and changes and how some things stick around and some things seem to go away. But at what point at what point do you have this feeling that something needs to stay or that something has become uh, uh, useful in making that in making that translation, if that makes sense? Yeah, well, I mean, I think so, like, for example, this painting came before the one that you were talking about before that was just the pattern. And so like this one, there was like a pleasure that I felt in the experience of making that purple yellow pattern in the center. And so at some point, you know, like there was another painting and then there was another painting and I was like, why don't I just, what happens? Can I make a painting that's just the pattern? And my poor little brain was like, I don't know, Hamlet, it probably needs something in it. You know, don't you think you need to, is a, is a pattern enough? Because another thing that I'm thinking a lot about, one of the shows that's really haunted me over, over the years is that October 18th, 1970, 1977 piece that Gerhard, Gerhard Richter did. And it's, it's at MoMA, and it's, I don't know, 15 paintings, something like that. And I just remember like going into that space and thinking about like that painting leads to this painting. Mm. And then this, this painting talks to this painting. And there was something about that room. There was something about the way those paintings talked about moving through a space or presenting a whole experience that was really interesting, that really has kind of haunted me. Mm. And so I'm really interested. So like this painting is the same size as most of the paintings that you've shown lately. And so they were all, I thought of them as um, parts of a whole, mm. like mm -hmm. they weren't necessarily like a polyptic or whatever you want to call it, but that painting talked to that painting and that painting led to this painting. And, and there was something about that that was appealing to me, not necessarily like for the Richter way of thinking about a whole uh, experience, but what I wanted to think about was almost like a mathematician, a, a mathematician showing their work, like to say like this, ah. This was something that like I really I loved. Like I loved this experience of making this thing. And then I wanted to see what would happen if I let it grow, you know, if it got bigger. Right. And and so sometimes these magic moments that I have happen in the studio. Sometimes they happen in front of other people's paintings. And so, you know, I'll lift bits 
or take bits from my paintings or other people's paintings and combine them. Like I was talking about before, those kind of weird chimeras, you know, like how, I don't know if you've ever been to like a cactus show, but like cactus people love taking like one kind of cactus and then like trimming a little bit off of it and then jamming it onto another cactus. Like a graft. And then you've got this like yes. weird ass, like graft cactus. It's awesome. Anyway, yeah. so, but, but sometimes when those parts get put together, there's this real weird dynamic energy that feels exciting and, 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 and new for me. Well, and, I, and then, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, and I love the, the, I love the notion of the graft, right? Because in, in, in plant grafting or in your, I've never been to a cactus show. Okay, but great. I, I think I think something that would be fascinating to me about the notion of that graft is the fact that you're able to connect one plant that does not belong with another plant, mm -hmm. but yeah. they not only survive, but they grow they thrive, and, yes. and become better than they were before. Yeah. Right. So that that notion of the graft in, in the way you're talking about this is is, is beautiful. I love that. Mm -hmm. And there's another example I've got lined up here between what is this painting and mm -hmm. then this painting. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm assuming this yeah. is a similar thing. Right. And then the one. It, the ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, you know, in that grafting, in, in, in that way that you kind of move. And I don't know where the chronology is between these, if this came first and then this followed. These are all 2020. Yeah, those were all from last year, mm -hmm. from oh. the okay. summer. Yeah, because it's like, I, you know, I, I actually really appreciate the way this space now begins to get sort of, um, I don't want to say obliterated, but almost obliterated, right? The way in mm -hmm. which it sort of begins to now break up mm -hmm. underneath, layered below these. Wow. It's almost like continental drift is kind of like moving and reshaping that sea. Mm. You know, it's, it's really quite nice that way. Um, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I've got like 45 images to show, so I kind of yeah. want to keep on plowing. Keep going. That's fine. <laughs> I'll be quiet. Uh, let's Aww. see what's going on in the comments here. So mom says this one looks beautiful like a weaving. Mm -hmm. Jess says, yeah, I love the texture. So there's some good stuff happening. I want to get to like, I want, oh, earlier there was a question that I totally glazed over from 63 on the screen. And I, I made a mental note to remember that. And now that this painting is on the board, it recalled, I recalled it, but 63 asked if you were inspired by Tom Naskowski. Oh yeah. 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 You know, he, he, he was there when you and I were there. Yes. Yes. No, I, I love Tom. Tom yeah. is actually, um, I think he, he's one of the people whose language meshes the best with mine. Like I remember him talk and it was like how some people talk about like reading a novel from 300 years ago and they're like oh my god that's exactly how i feel about blank and like tom and i i i got to work with him at at Rhodes. he came and did a show and um he and um and his wife both both came to memphis and um working with tom and, and my connection with him is one of my most favorite things about my life. Yeah, Tom, Tom Naskowski for me uh, represents a, a, now hopefully the person I'm gonna mention in this will never watch this show because I just, you know, sometimes you don't wanna put things out there in the world. But when I was an undergraduate, Tom Naskowski came to teach at Mason Grove School of the Arts at Rutgers in yeah. the final year I was there. And mm. I had a choice to take Tom or to take Joan Semmel. And Joan Semmel had been my painting teacher for three semesters. And, and I knew, I knew that Joan really liked me. And I was like, am I gonna take the unknown? I like this guy's work, but am I gonna take the unknown or am I gonna go with what's familiar? And I chose Joan. And that was the biggest mistake in my undergrad because that, she turned on me. She made me cry. And I thought, what an opportunity I missed. I missed taking a class with Tom Naskowski. Anyway, sorry, this is not I, about me. This is not about me. Well, no, but I, I, I remember when, when he came and I, I don't remember if I knew about his work before he was there 
at Vermont or not. I might not have. I don't know. Mm. But but I remember I remember it was still a slide carousel, and every slide he went through, he would click on one, and I would go, "Fuck," <laughs> and then he would click on another one, and I'd be like, "God damn it." <laughs> And then he would click on another one, and I would be like, "Yeah." And then he would click on another one, yeah. and like, and it was the it was the invention, the um, like the willingness to destroy and find, and the improvisation. Like one of my like, I hope it never goes away. His son did that great thing where he took a walk with his dad. I love on, that on video. YouTube. Uh, I show it to my students all the time, uh, and every time I've shown it, the students have been like, what the hell are you doing? Except for this one time, and this one time, it was during COVID, I, I showed it, and the students were like, that is the coolest fucking thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, I love you guys. Yeah. You guys are like my favorite people ever. So for those of you that are out there in the audience, when your show is over and you want to see a beautiful video about a painter, oh, look so up beautiful. Tom Naskowski. His son, Casimir, uh, I believe it's Casimir, uh, yeah. made a couple of very raw videos of Tom talking. The sound quality is not great, but they do one where they take a hike. And on the hike, they happen upon this yard of junk out in the middle mm -hmm. of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And there are these, these moments that feed into Tom's painting and where he gets his ideas from. And he talks about... Mm -hmm these circular forms on the ground, right? There yeah. are there are bottoms of bottles and cans and how they interact with the moss and the lichens mm -hmm. that are in the rock and the color palettes between them. This is something that most people would just look right past. But Tom mm. is down on his knees talking about these relationships in what appears to be a junkyard. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. And it, it really, if you're, look, if you're trying to understand the way an artist looks at the world, that's the video to look at. Mm. And he's such a he he was such a generous, sweet, like just giving person. Mm. You know, like I remember doing a studio visit with him and he and he had the biggest donuts I've ever seen. Like the most beautiful, ridiculous gourmet donuts. And he just we just sat around and hung out and looked at paintings and ate donuts and he turned me on to Lefty Frizzell and he, and then he sent me like a Lefty Frizzell uh, 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 mixtape. He was just the, he's just one of the nicest guys. And I, I, I owe a lot to him yeah. for sure. Yeah, no, I think it's a really good reference. And um, I've always been interested in the, uh, I, I think it was Tom Naskowski's work that really helped me understand abstraction in a way I had not understand it before. And so now knowing him and understanding what he's talked about, I can look at m more painting, you know, and, mm -hmm. and really think about it in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 63 saying, what's that video? Oh, he says, thanks. Okay, so it's, uh, apparently it came up. Did somebody put it up there? What's this one? It's Thomas Niskowski on a hike, and it is Yeah, on, that's it. It's, like Kazmir N, which is his son. Kazmir N. Yeah. And I think it's on either YouTube or Vimeo. This is on YouTube. Yeah, it's on, it's on YouTube. YouTube. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see, 67 says, great video, I've shown that too. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Hagenbush is talking about this piece on the screen and he's saying, jewels on a marble floor, the colors really glow like neon. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's it, Sounds right? Good. That's it, I love that, I, I love that. Um, just seeing if there's anything else here that I wanna cover before I keep popping through these. So you have some interesting references in your chronology to, um, to, um, where am I going? I, I started drinking the resin. Oh. So you're going you're to have to fill in the blanks for me. Well, um, when you start your chronology, you start with some of these, uh, you start with artists and what they've done. And uh, mm. right away, you mentioned Klimt. And I do see sure. some parallels oh, yeah, 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 Klimt yeah, yeah. and, and yeah, for the sure. jewels and stuff like that. Um, I love the decorative, I love the decorative nature of how, I love how Klimt is able to take what I want to refer to, and this is normally, this is a taboo word, 
but I want to refer to this element of decoration, mm -hmm. but makes mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. makes it not decoration. Yes. Right. It's an integrated element to the painting that it, it becomes something else. It, does that make sense? Yeah. For me, the the clips have always been about either the landscapes. I love those square format mm -hmm. landscapes of his, and then the, all the stuff that he does just to make flesh pop. Like he he goes to unbelievable links to make flesh fleshy. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, 63 is saying, would Hamlet entertain going back to oils? Um, and then he says P and D, careful there, um, P and D. P and D. 63, we need clarification on P and D. Yeah. Pumpkin Audrey wants to know, how long does it take to complete a work for you? Like, what do you that's typically spend in the studio on a piece? It depends on all the other shit that's going on. Of course. And, but like in the summertime, when I'm a full-time painter, a big painting will take two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. So I can, I can move pretty fast. So like this one was uh, five by six. Mm -hmm. And so this one over, this was a summer painting. And so this one I could finish in like two weeks, three weeks. Gotcha. But yeah. that's like, you know, eight hour days and blowing through books on tape. Oh, and that's what you just reminded me. Uh, okay, so one of my favorite memories is when you and I first met. Uh, one of the things you said to me or that you revealed about yourself that just blew the top of my head right off is that you had recorded on cassette every <laughs> single episode of This American <laughs> Life. Yeah, with from, from real-time audio. From real-time audio. So that meant you yes. listened to every single episode and that but was... i mean this was in 2000 so we're only talking about like four years worth. okay still still to me at that time yeah. that was really brilliant and i love that Man, show mm -hmm. that show is so good oh my god that show Re recently the the show that they did called the daily yep. where they riffed on the daily yep oh like just when i think they're I mean, I've never thought that they're they're phoning it in. It's it's one of my favorite podcasts, but or radio shows, whatever, whatever. But like that show, man. Yeah, no, for sure, for yeah. sure. Uh, Carolyn Thau wants to know: Do you work on one piece at a time or many? I do. Yeah, it's one one at a time. Okay. Now, in the old days, with uh, with oil, I would have four yeah. or five going. At you had time. you had to yeah. right because you need. But to now it's just time. like, which is why I can finish one in two weeks and which is also why a lot of times i'll say i'm not done with an idea or i'm not done with a riff and i'll i'll play a little bit more in that territory mm -hmm. how often um, and this is something not from the chat but from me it's like once you feel like you've fleshed out a riff right are there moments two years three years down the road you know that it comes back and it's like and, and how much I'm, I'm curious about how much the work in between that gap really informs the new visitation of that riff because that's something that i think we all kind of we all kind of want to do but maybe feel like can't i think that's that's something that came about when i was in rome was giving myself more time to stay in one area and so like normally i'd be like okay i did that i'm never doing that again and so now the next painting has to feel totally different but now i'm and then i'm also more interested in that idea of jamming things together so like jamming the pattern together with these circles you know or um whatever uh let's see memory vessel saying i arrived late so don't know if you talked about this earlier but would you say process part of your art making specifically with repetitive form but would you say process, I'm, a, I'm thinking she's saying process is a part of your art making, specifically with repetitive forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. Yeah, totally, totally. And that kind of um, sort of meditative, slow mm -hmm. build that happens just in the physicality of, of, of making a painting. Right, right. Um, I wanted to get to, go ahead, what were you gonna say? Well, I just can't, it's, when I was reading over the chronology, I know I keep going back to that, but that was such an interesting peek into some of the things that were happening in your mind. And I can't get over the scientific 
uh, relationship with some of your artwork. Like I know you said, oh, I failed chemistry or something like that. Uh, but there's so many ties into molecular structures and microbiology. Mm. And then we see like these concentric mm. ring patterns. So we see some um, things going on with plant-based materials. So, and when you think about the genesis of humans or animals or creatures, it begins on the cellular level, which is much mm. like a thought or much like the origin of your chronology. And it just keeps blossoming out and it gets more and more complex as you go along and it's like merging from this pattern and like when i start looking and this is like such a great example of that and i'm just like oh my god there's so much going on in here and is do you think i don't i actually don't even want to ask a question about it because it's funny because you had said you know when you're trying to answer questions and what were you thinking sometimes the the beauty of it is not knowing like, I almost don't want to know how you start, like, I don't know if you want, if you splatter paint all over and then you start working in, or I don't know if you just start with a little detail and start building on, because mm. mm -hmm. there's magic in not knowing, you know, and it's like life. I well, don't know. Yeah, but there's, and, and, and so. No, but Terry, you're, 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 you're totally right. I mean, on all of the stuff that you said, it's the big and the small, the macro and the micro, mm -hmm. and overhead and from the side and juxtaposing all of these different ways of looking yeah and um the way things just combine in my brain in my in my studio experience you know how one book can get laid next to another one mm -hmm. and these juxtapositions you know the juxtapositions can kind of sing mm -hmm. yeah i mean that's I mean, everything that you're saying is, is, is totally right. Yeah. Yeah. Bujaz says it's kind of like microbiology, yeah. but, but microbiology, but in a fifth or sixth dimension, sort of like the places where the strings in string theory meet follows up with, of course, strings would be smaller than Planck length. So yeah, there's kind of like this really interesting kind of that vibrational quality to strings inside of string theory mm -hmm. and how there are various harmonies mm -hmm. and how those harmonies sort of hold the universe together, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, I love that reference to what goes on in pieces sounds great. like, like, uh, like, why can't I get it to come up? This one mm -hmm. and this one, uh, mm -hmm. let's see. See, uh, Pumpkin Audrey says, I see mitochondria. Jess Park says, love these. Reminds me of those clay or Murano glass beads that look cross-sectional. That's a really beautiful that reference. That sounds good. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Love that reference. Uh, Memory Vessel's talking about chemistry. You can fail and get chemistry all at once. Mm. Yes, that's fantastic. Uh, Gary 987, these circles appear three dimensional. Yeah, the, I love that in the flatness, there's this other, you know, like there's a, there's, there's flatness and dimensionality built into these in a really sort of sophisticated kind of way, mm -hmm. right? Um, just how all the forms are relating and they're creating this whole, it's just, it's really glorious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We gotta keep moving. We're gonna, yeah. we don't wanna run Hamlet Ooh. too far over our time. Oh my God, it's 918. The time flies when we're having a good time. Um, Can you describe like a typical day in the studio? Like, what do you like to do? Do you like to listen to a certain music? Do you like to drink coffee? Like, what do you like to do? Man, every I have, I have, I have two biological kids that I that I live with half the time, and then I have three of my fiance's children that are here with us most of the time, and we have three cats, and so. And I teach, and so no day is the same. But in the summertime, usually I have my espresso, and then I come out to the studio at some point. And um, usually I'll start off with the podcast to kind of catch up and to be in the news. And then um, I go to the gym so that I don't have a heart attack and die. And then I will come back and work in the summertime you know um and then usually in the afternoon i'll listen to like a book on tape but if i'm and then also i have like different cycles so like i'll have a time where i'll spend a week building the stretchers for the next year or i'll spend a month 
making the um, the maquettes for the paintings that I'll make for the next year. And so that time is really different. That time is much more um, like getting into the Philip Guston zone, mm. you know, where like I'm listening to Tool really loud and I'm um, sort of submerged in the source material and I'm trying to figure out how to do this stuff. And sometimes that stuff is based on a series of drawings that I did, um, but I have, I have like cycles, you know, um, and then, but, but in terms of the studio, um, so like today, for example, podcasts in the morning, went to the gym, came back, listened to this great book called uh, Long Division, hmm. and then um, sat on the porch and read some poems. My sister is a poet. And I, I have this project. I had to make a project. When I when I turned 50, I realized that I, my sister gave me some books of poems and I did what I always do. I was like, thank you. And then I read two of them and I put them on the shelf. And then I was like, I'm 50. You know, like if I don't read these books, I'm gonna, they're just gonna be unread. And so I did this thing and then also on my 50th birthday i got a porch swing and so i sit on the porch and i read poems out loud in alphabetical order from the the the, the amazing library quality collection of books that my sister has given me over the years and so the other day i read from a book from that my sister had given me in 1997 that I had never even cracked and it was awesome. Huh. And part of the project is that I have to read them out loud and more often than not, I read them to my cat. And that way, if someone comes by, I can say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reading these to my cat so that I don't <laughs> sound like a crazy person. <laughs> and, um, but it's kind of a way for me to finish the day and to kind of mark the end of the, the studio day and then I'll come inside and fix dinner for the family and we'll we'll watch TV. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I love that. I think that's a really good place for us to kind of like I, I love hearing about that kind of day. Yeah. You know, to dive, you know, to kind of like cap the conversation off with how mm -hmm. all of that goes. Yeah. We've got so, you know, there's so mm -hmm. Hamlet, I've got like I know Terry's got five pages of I notes. I feel like we can do a part two and part three. We could go on for four. hours, but it's like nine, yeah. it, well, 8.23 on your clock and 9.23 on mine, right? Are you an hour? You're an hour off, right? Yeah, we're an hour behind. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I mean, yes, we should end the show at some point, but I would love to hang out and visit with you guys at some point. Just yes. answer yes. questions and visit and chat and Actually, stuff. Actually, we would like to come down to Memphis. It's one oh, of my please, favorite come cities. To Memphis. It was Terry's first road trip. It was trip. my very first road trip in college, and my girlfriend and I are big. I've been an Elvis fan since I can't remember. You talk about the those origin points in your history. I can't yes. remember when I loved him. I just always did. And she did, too. And I was actually, we were roommates at the time at Rutgers and my parents, that was my graduation present. They gave me money. We went on a road trip. We went all the way down to Memphis, Tennessee. Now, what did you do while you were here? Uh, I did, we packed so much of Graceland. We saw, we saw sure. all of Graceland, but we saw Beale Street. We saw the Lorraine Motel, um, sure. National Civil Rights Museum. We went on the uh, Mississippi Queen. We did a riverboat thing. And this was just in the course of three days. There was so much to see. The Peabody Hotel. There's such ducks, rich culture yeah. and rich history. Ducks, Home yeah. of the Blues. It's it's such a fantastic city. And I keep telling Todd, I'm like, oh, I would love to go down there again. Oh, my God. So, you guys should totally do that. We should get in the yeah. Volkswagen bus. Yeah. And we should oh my drive God. down there in the West yeah. Valley. And we could camp along the way. Yeah. That's so great. fun. So fun. Jess Park says, I love the idea of a ritual to mark the end of the workday, especially when working from home. Mm. Because that I, is tricky. Uh, yeah. I think we, we, we talk a lot about how when we merge our workspace with our home space, distractions, blah, 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 and, and how to delineate those spaces, mm -hmm. right? 
But I always, and, I, and I've been successful at that to some degree when I walk in here to sit down to begin working. Uh, not the bar that we're sitting in now, but the, you know, <laughs> I just I just pulled the curtain back. Anyway, um, but the end of the workday is, I think, another point that bears, needs that kind of demarcation mm -hmm. line to further separate those spaces. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. It is definitely, like, like it's something that, you know, we, we, we talk about a lot. Like my fiance, she had her studio out here with me for a while and she had never had a studio in the house. Uh, her studio had always been in the house, but she was having a lot of trouble with just, you know, ignoring domesticity and coming out to the studio and doing stuff. And, and so she ended up needing to get a studio away and so you know it's it, it's totally tricky it's it's some people can turn that off some people you know need need the distance like i remember when i was an undergrad or grad school there was something about just that five minute drive to the studio away from the apartment that was like a change in headspace you know yep. um and so it, it you know but for me, I've had my studio in the home for since 2003, mm -hmm. so I, yeah. I've mostly gotten used to it. Major piece. Sometimes the sometimes the dishes will stack up. Mm. Laundry needs to get full. Yeah, I, I might do that too occasionally, and I'm getting I'm getting looked at. I'm getting looked at right now about that, so I hear it. Uh, ben Hagenbush says that sounds terrific. I'll sleep on the roof, meaning he's going to be riding in the bus. Uh, mom says that it's, mom's saying fabulous show tonight. Love his work. Yes. Mom's saying it's Thanks. time to go now. Tom. I love how your mom, your mom shows up. It's great. She it? She's been, she watches every show. Every single show. Nobody on this channel has more viewer loyalty points than her. I, 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 I'm positive of that. So that's one of the reasons why she wins everything. Pumpkin Audrey says, Hamlet, so great to meet you. Thanks, Terry and Todd. No problem, Bob, Pumpkin Audrey. Um, so, you know, I got to tell you, this was great. And I, I, I love the way you so perfectly sort of fulfill what it was that you know, we set out to make this show about becoming more comfortable with talking to artists and talking about art. And I, and I, and I love being able to talk to you about this stuff because the, the candor and, and the, the laid back kind of nature with which, you know, the process takes place. It's just, it's exactly to me how it should be. And I feel like this was just such a fantastic evening and, and I really appreciate getting to spend that with you. Well, thanks, thanks for inviting me. I, I was so excited when you sent that message that I, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Well, one thing we should also tell everybody yes. is that you are going to be having a show in August uh, would you like to tell us about that so I don't have to spoil that surprise? I'll leave it to you. Yeah, I'm I'm super excited. We're going to do a online show um, with the with the people there at the at the Brownstone. Yep. And so we're super excited about that. And um, I'm working feverish feverishly on 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 work for the show. And then um, I think David and Josh and I are going to meet up in a couple of weeks virtually and 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 take a look at some things and figure out what what fits and what doesn't yeah. and then um but yeah I'm, I'm i'm super excited about that and then it's just kind of a the 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 constant making and thinking about how these things come together and so i'm super excited about about being able to do that that show there uh, at the Brownstone. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. Yeah, we're really excited that you guys made that connection and we cannot wait to see that. And maybe, I don't know if this will really happen, but yeah. maybe we could get to Memphis. Yes. Before or around the time that happens, that would just be. Oh my God, you guys should totally come here. And then we could do, we could have the New Jersey people in Memphis to do the virtual opening oh, for the show good. that's in happening Brooklyn. in yeah. New York. That's fantastic. I love, I love that. that idea. That's a great Maybe idea. we could also get David and Josh. Yeah. So we all they, come they, to they get They could all just come to Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just have the show in Memphis. <laughs> well, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll reach out to David and say, you want to go for a ride in the Westphalia? We'll all, oh, we'll yeah. all you know. Yeah. That would be like 
the ultimate road trip. I gotta tell you, the, the, the refrigerator in this camper works when you're driving. And so all we'd have, we'd it have does. cold drinks. Yeah. We could cook. We just can't have open. Well, that's for another time. Stuff. All right. Well, Hamlet, thank you. Yes. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys. You. It's a treat. Yeah. We, I, I know our viewers loved it. There's a lot of comments going by. Carolyn Thau says, Hamlet, love your work. Very nice to meet you. Jess Park says, excellent show. Loved meeting Hamlet and seeing his work. Thank you. Uh, ben Higginbush says, great show tonight. So again, from the bottom of my heart, you're, you're the best. We really appreciate it. Well, if anybody it. has any questions, I'm, I'm easy to find. So, so if, if, if we missed a question or something, let me know. All right. That's awesome. Hamlet, you have a great night. We'll be talking to you soon. We're looking forward to the show at the Brownstone Art. Me too. And uh, we will catch up with you soon. All right, buddy? Okay. All right. Bye, y'all. Good to see you. Take care. Thanks. All right. Well, that was awesome. That was awesome. He is. He's amazing. He is amazing. It's so, uh, Skultori says, "Great to hear an artist talk." Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I uh, I actually was hoping Skultori that you'd jump on tonight. I thought you'd. Uh, I thought you'd actually really like this. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, sixty three says, "Thanks, TNT." You're but he also up. says, "That's how I got to Memphis. Check the song out." Frank, yeah, to talk frankly about their work. He didn't finish mm -hmm. his thought there. Yeah. yeah, that's that's one of the things I really miss. That's, that's what, one of the things. Well, that's one of the reasons why we started the show too. Yeah, yeah, yeah because this is the, this is the type of thing that I feel makes it accessible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. anyway, keep your eyes peeled for uh, news about Hamlet's show at the Brownstone Art in Brooklyn. Uh, we will keep you up to date on that for sure. Um, We've got a great show lined up for next week, so mm -hmm. we're not going to say anything about that just yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, we will also be hanging out in the city this weekend, trying to get some shows covered yes. so that we can add some more content. So yeah. hopefully, um, you know, we'll have some of that available for you very soon. Yeah. Tom T. Hale song, amazing. All right, we got to write that okay. one down. We, we got to make sure we write that up. down. So uh, anyway, right. I've got. I've, I've got, got a lot a of, you know what, I'm traps. sorry, there's no way I'm finishing this tonight, or you guys won't see me until next week. Oh, dear. That is, this That's is. That's 9%. This is fierce. Ooh. Careful now. Oh, I'm spilling my drink. So, episode 43, under the, under the, uh, in the can? Is that what they call it? <laughs> guys, thanks so in much for books. hanging out. In the books. In, in the, the books. books. Yes. There you go. All right. All right. Thanks so much for hanging out tonight. We really appreciate having you along and your support. Um, have a great week. We'll see you on Tuesday. Yes. Take care. Cheers. Cheers.